Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'm delighted to follow Nicholas Gantz's fascinating paper. Uh, the unsolicited writings that I shall be dealing with come from a time, place and society in which they were more like pages from diaries than public statements, uh, as we shall see. I might also mention that the uh, graffito or unsolicited statement in Pompeii that he showed uh, almost certainly uh, is a, a writing of one of the nomads that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, we have a nine others uh, by, by these nomads in Pompeii, uh, so it's not quite so uh, surprising as it might seem. Anyway, could we have the next slide, please? In the deserts of what is now Saudi Arabia, Jordan and southern Syria, in the second half of the first millennium BC and the first few centuries AD, the nomads learned to read and write. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, surprising, at least to a 21st century viewer, since the available writing materials were limited to desert rocks. Next, please. Papyrus outside Egypt was expensive, and broken pottery, which was used by settled people as we use bits of paper, wasn't available since nomads, if ever, uh, rarely, if ever, carried pottery because, uh, next please, uh, in a nomadic lifestyle, in a desert, could we have the next, uh, please? Uh, in a desert full of rocks, it got broken and was difficult to replace. To nomads, rocks were not much use for sending letters or writing records, which would need to be consulted at a later date, unless, of course, you are this chap. Next, please. We don't know how or why they first learnt to read and write, but this is a possible scenario. Next, please. A nomad visiting an oasis might have seen a merchant or scribe writing and asked, what are you doing? To which the merchant or scribe might have said, I'm writing, of course. The inquisitive nomad might then have said, purely out of curiosity, can you teach me to do that? And if the oasis dweller had time and thought it might be interesting to do it, he would have written out the letters of the alphabet, expressing the sounds as he did so. Since the nomad came from a non-literate society, he would have had an excellent memory and would have picked up the relationship between the letters and their equivalent sounds very quickly. Next, please. So when he went back to his family, he would have shown off his new skill, drawing the letters in the de desert dust, or carving them on a, rock, on a rock. His family and friends would also have learnt quickly, and so the knowledge would have spread out of curiosity. This, of course, is simply one possibility, and there may well have been others. Next, please. However, I have had this personal experience similar to what I have described. On an excavation in southern Jordan in the early 1970s, a Bedouin workman saw me writing notes and asked if I could teach him to write. So he held out his hand and a barrow, and I wrote the Arabic letters in their unjoined up forms, pronouncing them as I did so. And the next day he was writing my name and his name, still in the unjoined up forms. Next, please. A similar thing happened in the 1930s at the site of Lachish in what is now Israel. When the famous Lachish letters were found written on potsherds in Paleo-Hebrew, the non-literate Bedouin workman, for fun, asked one of the archaeologists to teach them the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. He did so, and despite the fact that the alphabet bit had only 22 consonants and their Arabic dialect had 27, they started writing notes to each other and to the archaeologist in their spoken Arabic dialect using the Paleo-Hebrew script. As far as we know, none of these no notes have survived, but if one were to be found, I dread to think what damage it could do to Semitic historical linguistics. Next, please. Uh, next, please. However, in antiquity, having nothing to write on except rocks and dust, the skill would not have turned the nomad society from a non-literate one relying on memory and speech to a literate one relying on writing for record and communicate or communication. So these nomads remained a non-literate society, but with the ability to read and write. An interesting paradox. Next, please. 
A similar situation existed among the Tuareg of Northwest Africa, who have a script of their own known as the Tafina. This has now become a national symbol for a now literate society. But until 30 or 40 years ago, when most of the Tuareg were a non-literate society, the Tafina script was used for games, graffiti, and occasionally short notes between lovers. It was considered childish by many adults, and although Tuareg men and women had learnt it, uh, all Tuareg men and women had learnt it as children and could read and write in it, sheikhs and other people concerned for their dignity would pretend they knew nothing about it. So much uh, was it considered a game that if a Tuareg wanted to send a letter to another Tuareg, he would not use the tafina, but would ask a relative who had been to school uh, to write it in Arabic or French, even though the recipient would have to get the letter in Arabic or French translated. I am not, of course, saying that the situation among the ancient nomads of Arabia and the Tuareg of 40 years ago was identical, but I hope that this modern example of literacy in a non-literate society is helpful. Next, please. The scripts which these ancient nomads learnt are part of what is known as the South Semitic scripts family. This developed very early from the first alphabet in the, in the early second millennium BC, in parallel to the Phoenicio-Aramaic or Northwest Semitic script family, from which today all but one traditional al alphabets derive. The South Semitic script family uh, was used throughout Arabia and by the nomads in the deserts of Jordan and southern Syria. Next, please. Uh, the ancient South Arabian formal script, Musnad, and the informal script, Zabur, as well as those of the oases of Northwest Arabia, Tema, Dadan, and Dumat, and the scripts used by nomads, all belong to this script family, as does the Ethiopian vocalized alphabet used to write Ge'ez and Amharic, which is still in use today. Next, please. One of the features of these scripts is that each letter is separate and there are no joins. Another feature is that while word dividers are used in the ancient South Arabian scripts and the formal scripts of the Northwest Arabian oases, all but a handful of those used, to, used by the nomads do not employ them and so present a continuous stream of consonants. For, in addition, the scripts used by the nomads show no vowels, vowels either long or short, or even diphthongs. This, of course, makes for a large amount of ambiguity and brings us to the context in which these inscriptions, or rather tags and graffiti, if you'll excuse the, the term, uh, were carved. Uh, the, uh, next, please. Uh, next, please. Oh, sorry, thank you. Since writing didn't play an essential or useful part in the nomad societies, it remained more of a curiosity and could be used to pass the time when they were alone all day out in the desert, pasturing the sheep, goats and camels. Fortunately, the basalt desert of southern Syria, northeastern Jordan and northern Saudi Arabia is overlaid on limestone, and so there are plenty of flints which can be used to carve the basalt. In addition, the basalt desert is a huge area of broken up lava flows, one of the features of which is that over millennia, the interaction of the chemicals in the stone and those in the atmosphere produce a very thin red or black patina over all the exposed surfaces of the rocks. Next, please. When this patina is pierced by a scratch, the pumice color of the lava look, the below looks almost white in contrast to the surrounding red or black, and so makes graffiti stand out nicely. Next, please. The majority of the inscriptions by nomads are tags i.e. the author's name and part of his or her genealogy, use usually of two or three generations. Next, play it, please. But sometimes up to 17 generations, going back to the tribal ancestor, and in this case, spread over three stones. Next, please. In many cases, the authors continued directly with a prayer. Next, please. Uh, and in others with a narrative saying what he or she was doing or had done or how they were feeling, the present situation, gossip from the desert or from the settled lands, etc. And then usually a prayer. And the prayers are almost invariably for uh, security, uh, plus other things like rain and booty and so on. 
It's important to emphasize that these graffiti were personal statements in a public space, and so were self-expression, not communication, except perhaps with the deities to whom the prayers were addressed. Next, please. They clearly uh, were often read by others, because the person who read them often carved a graffito beside them, saying that they had found the text and, almost invariably, was sad, presumably because the original author was no longer alive or was far away. Next, please. The one practical thing for which these nomads used their literacy was carving gravestones uh, and recording the, uh, that they were mourning for the dead person and or helping to build a cairn over their grave. Here you can see two such stones, on each of which the statement that these are respectively the bur burial cairns of a dead man and a dead woman, plus expressions of mourning by relatives and, uh, and uh, relatives, and it records that they helped build the cairn. Next, please. The fact that the vast majority of these texts were carved for the satisfaction of their authors, rather than as communication to other human beings, means that the orthographic difficulties of the script, no vowels, no word division, etc., were of no concern to the authors, since they knew what they meant, uh, as presumably that did the deities they prayed to. And that was all that mattered. Next, please. This, together with the fact that the script was not being used for communication in ink in everyday life, means that it did not develop in the ways most alphabetic scripts used by literate societies do, i.e. a single direction of writing, word division, and in many cases, matres lexionis, or some other ways of showing at least some of the vowels. Next, please. Most of the tags and graffiti of the nomads can be written in any direction, left to right, right to left, boustrophedon, vertically, up and uh, either up or down or both, round in a coil, etc. And they can wander over rocks of various shapes and often uh, across several rocks, all depending on what was comfortable for the author or whether he or she was experimenting or playing with their text. Next, please. This is possible because, unlike the Roman script, None of the letters rely on their stance for their interpretation, and so are never upside down or back to front. Uh, you'll see some examples from the Roman uh, script in the bottom left-hand corner. This is another indication that writing in ink on soft materials or potsherds was not used in these nomadic societies, since this results in unidirectional writing. It's difficult to carve a nip that will write in both directions, and often by, uh, but by no means always, of course, in joined-up writing. These constraints are, of course, absent when you're only carving on stone. Next, please. However, having just said this, there are, in fact, graffiti where some or all of the letters have been joined, often resulting in making them very difficult to read. Sometimes this seems to have been done by the author, and at other times by someone else as a form of vandalism. However, these joins are entirely different from those which develop when writing in ink. In many cases, they're just a line carved through all the letters, as here. Uh, next, please. Uh, in others, uh, there, there are far more joins between the individual letters than would be necessary to ease writing in ink, and which only make more work for the carver <laughs> and the reader, I may say. Uh, and next, please. Many graffiti end with curses on those who would damage them, a curse heartily endorse, endorsed by frustrated epigraphists, such as this one, which is also an example of the quite common habit of carving one's name and genealogy in large chiseled letters, and then continuing the text in smaller incised ones. This may look like self-aggrandisement on the part of the author, but it may simply be the result of exhaustion after carving the name and, and genealogy. Next, please. On the other hand, authors themselves can play games with their inscription. Here, the author has added fingers to the letter Y, the name of which, at least in Northwest Semitic alphabets, was Yud, hand, and a pupil to the letter Ein, which means I. This is particularly interesting since it would could suggest that at least some of the nomads may have known the names of the letters, something one normally only learns in formal education. 
On the other hand, it could simply be playfulness on the part of this author. We have no other examples uh, who saw a forearm and hand in the vertical line with a circle at the top and an eye in the simple circle. Next, please. Members of a particular lineage group, the Amirat, tended to use more angular forms of the letters, and some were particularly inventive in the ways they played with them. Thus, this author has carved his text Bustrophedon, but has kept all the letters, the, the letters all facing in the same way. So the, the middle uh, line, which is going actually reading from left to right, uh, the, let, the, the, the letters are all facing right to left, as in the other two lines. While here, uh, next please, sorry. Uh, while here, uh, the authors are fitting letters inside each other, despite, despite crossing word boundaries, i.e. these clusters include both letters from one word and letters from the next. This strongly suggests that these nomads wrote as they spoke in a continuous flow and did not think of language in written terms as separate words, as we do. Next, please. Another example of this is the common expression in writing of the assimilation of sounds between words, as here between the enclitic third person uh, uh, pronoun, uh, uh, at the end of a one word, and the, de the definite article, ha, at the beginning of the following word. This again strongly suggests that in their society, they did not use literacy for communication or record, as one does in a literate society. And so the separation in the mind of the writer, writer sorry, of the written word from the stream of sounds in speech had not taken place, or at least for many of them. Uh, next, please. This author may well have been in contact with scripts such as Greek, which were used for writing in ink, and so were arranged in successive lines, all running in the same direction, left to right. I suggest Greek as the script which may have influenced him because the content suggests that he may have served in the Roman army, where in the Eastern Empire, uh, Greek was uh, the lingua franca, though it could have been Latin, the official language of the Roman um, army, but almost certainly not. Greek and Latin were the only two left to right scripts used in the Eastern Empire at the time. Next, please. We know that some of the nomads could write in, albeit fairly simple, Greek, because we have bilinguals, and even, next please, graffiti in Greek by people who were clearly nomads. As I've said, we know that a number of these nomads served in the Roman army and may well have picked up some Greek there. Indeed, some of the graffiti say their authors had mutinied and were on the run. Next, please. Another stone shows the male members of a family, including their slave, all writing their texts on the same stone. Apart from the names uh, and the inscription by the slave, uh, the inscriptions all say the same thing. By so-and-so, son of Ramin, uh, or Ramyan, uh, and he helped birth the goats the year Caesar announced the province, i.e. Trajan's announcement of the province of Arabia in AD 11, or 111, five years after the Roman army had taken over the Nabataean kingdom from which the province was formed. The fact that all texts are carved from left to right, I mean all these texts are carved from left to right, and look as though they were carved by the same hand, suggests this was a family memorial of the, to the birthing of the goats that year. Birthing the goats seems to have been a very significant event in the year, much more so than the birthing of sheep and camels, and it's very often dated. Next, please. Others would find it would be fun to carve their graffiti, graffiti over several stones, and this nomad did so across 11 faces of eight distinct rocks, which are still in the same place after 2,000 years. Next, please, please. To us, it's curious that when a nomad carved a beautiful drawing, they would then uh, often carve a graffito, saying they had drawn it, in such a way that the inscription spoils the drawing, at least to our eyes. Uh, why they did this, uh, why did they do this, when, as here, uh, next one, 
it was usually perfectly possible to fit in a text without impinging on the drawing. Unfortunately, we have no way of telling. Next, please. Was it that the text was more important to them than the drawing? It seems unlikely, given that the drawing would have taken much longer to achieve than most inscriptions. But on the other hand, it's perfectly understandable that the artist would want to claim uh, credit for it. Next, please. <clears throat> By this time, many of you maybe have been wondering, what about the women nomads? Uh, because the desert 2,000 years ago was a dangerous place to be out all day by yourself, watching over the flocks and herds and guarding them against wild carnivores and enemies, it seems that women did not do this as much as men and boys. Though, as you can see, we have uh, a few graffiti by women out in the desert. Next, please. However, both women and men also carved graffiti on stone vessels. And on this one, we have eight texts, six of them by women, all longing for, or perhaps just missing, somebody called Alba. Unfortunately, we don't know whether Alba was a man or a woman. Next, please. The visual effect of these inscriptions on stone vessels is one of chaos, and the type of texts on them are identical to those on the desert rocks. Next, please. Uh, there are other visual curiosities these authors have left us. Drawings of singing girls are quite common, and they are usually shown drawing out their hair. Uh, I can't really do that. Um, and often wiggling their hips, as shown by their tussle, tasseled belts flying. However, next please. However, here a nomad has copied the abundant flowing hair of the singing girl but placed his tag vertically where her body would, have, would be. Next, please. As I've explained, it seems that nomads who carved these texts wrote as they spoke. And here we find one who may have enjoyed the use of the same sounds in different orders, in the words suffer, writing, and faras, horseman. Next, please. Another possible game was to carve your tag in small letters between the large letters of another. Here the two authors do not seem to be related, then they may have been friends, or simply strangers visiting the spot at different times. Next, please. In some cases, an author decorated some of the letters in his text for no apparent reason, other than the pleasure of doing so. This, that this was play is suggested by the fact that other texts by the same author either have only a few letters decorated or all have been left plain. Next, please. There is only one case so far in these texts of a conversation, or rather an argument. As you can see here, Hamasik starts by making the quite common claim to have built an enclosure out of rocks to keep the sheep and goats at night. in at night. However, along comes Khalid and claims that he had made it. Hamasik replies roundly and calls Khalid a liar. And then Khalid says, no, it's Hamasik who's a liar. At, le at least at this distance, we can't tell whether this argument was serious or just banter. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Since carving these texts took a lot of work, even if it was a pastime, the nomads were keen to protect their texts and drawings from vandals, of which there seemed to have been a lot to judge from the number of vandalized texts. Many of the graffiti end with a curse on anyone who would damage the text or drawing, and it's possible that enclosing the text in a cartouche, i.e. a scratched or hammered line around it, was considered a way of protecting it, though it may have simply been a way of keeping it separate from other texts which might be carved on the same stone, as in the dividing lines separating texts on the stone at the bottom right of the side. This was often accompanied by one or more apparently apotropaic signs, the most common of which was a group of seven lines, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. Seven is, of course, a, a significant number in many societies and, un, un, societies, and unfortunately we can't know where it originated or what it meant in the society of these nomads. Next, please. <clears throat> However, in many cases, the seven dots are accompanied by a stick figure human with splayed hands. Again, we don't know the origin of this sign. 
the author of the text on the right appears to have been an apotropaic uh, enthusiast, what le or perhaps he just couldn't count, uh, since there are nine lines across the cartouche and the figure has seven fingers. Next. Uh, finally, I'm happy to say that thanks to the mobile phone, the modern Bedouin in the same deserts have recently decided <laughs> to become <laughs> literate. <laughs> and they are now covering the rocks with modern Arabic tags, graffiti, and memorials to the dead, uh, or often often including emojis. Uh, there are also also some humorous ones, such as that on the right, uh, which is the, the the message you get on a mobile phone when the number you're ringing is engaged or the phone is switched off. Why anyone would want to spend hours carving this is unknown. <laughs> One can only assume they must have been very bored. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, others have invented new ways to present their tags, writing, in inverted commas, their names in small stones. Uh, you can see there. Next, please. So what was the visual experience presented by all these graffiti and tags? At this distance of time, it's, of course, very difficult to say. As is usual with graffiti, the presence of one or more seems to have stimulated others, but by no means always. We have also to take into account the fact that most of the authors were out in the desert looking after goats, sheep and camels while they were grazing, and so often chose to sit at points with a good view over the land below. So it's not surprising that these places are now covered with graffiti. We have seen that these nomads often read the graffiti they found, and often added their own texts, saying that they were grieving for the authors, presumably because they were now dead or far away. But these tags and graffiti also provided visual experiences for later nomads. They remained as curiosities long after they ceased to be carved, and are mentioned centuries later in pre-Islamic or oral po Arabic oral poetry written down in the Islamic period. For instance, the poet Labid in his Mu'allaka says, the traces of the watercourses have become so worn that it looks as though their stones bear writing. Next, please. At a much later date, these graffiti have even been used as architectural decoration in a sacred building. Next, please. Thank you. <laughs>